Okay, let's get started. I'm Eric Nessler. I'm director of the Friedman Brain Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and it just gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Uh, this is part of our Diverse Brains series, which we began about six years ago to celebrate diversity and to make the point that it is absolutely essential that every member of our community has uh, the same opportunities, the same experience, uh, the same uh, productive, thriving future uh, as everyone else. And uh, we've been just delighted by uh, the impact that it's had locally at Mount Sinai and perhaps even beyond. Today's event is co-sponsored by our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and we're just absolutely thrilled to have Bianca Jones Marlin and Danielle uh, Camblar join us uh, for today's event. Uh, Aya Osman, a postdoctoral fellow at Mount Sinai, and Joe Simon, a neuroscience PhD graduate student, should get all the credit for organizing the program, and, and I'm gonna turn things over to them. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nessler, um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's our pleasure to welcome you back to our second session of the Impact of Racism on Mental Health series, presented to you by the Friedman Brain Institute and the Office for Diversity and Inclusion. My name is Aya Osman, and along with my colleague, Joe Simon, will be moderating today's seminar. I wanted to start by setting the stage for today's discussion. As we all know, we've been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in some form, and it has turned our world upside down and made us question many norms and assumptions. As big of a challenge as it has been, it has also provided us with the unique opportunity to elicit real change, especially in light of the social injustices that this pandemic has brought to light. Today, we'll be discussing the inheritance of trauma and in particular race-related trauma and how that can present an additional layer of complications faced by impacted individuals as they attempt to navigate life and the workplace. Our two speakers today will present some of the latest research and clinical perspectives on inherited racial trauma, and we will end with discussing how such perspectives can inform actions aimed at eradicating racism, improving brain health and social well-being of impacted communities. We would like to remind the audience that there will be a 15 to 20 minute panel discussion at the end of this session, where we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please feel free to send your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the presentation, and we'll delve into these at the end. So without further ado, it is my honor to present to you our first speaker, world-renowned and inspirational neuroscientist, Bianca Jones Marlin, who is the Herbert and Florence Irving Assistant Professor of Cell Research and the principal investigator of the Marlin Lab at Columbia University's Zuckerman Institute. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from New York University School of Medicine and a dual bachelor's degree in biology and adolescent education from St. John's University. During her postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Richard Axel, Dr. Marlin began to investigate how trauma experienced by parents affects the brain structure and sensory experience of their future offspring via epigenetic mechanisms. Moreover, during her graduate studies, she examined how the brain adapts to care for a newborn and uncovered fundamental roles for the neuromodulator oxytocin. She now aims to utilize neurobiology and the science of learning to better inform both the scientific community and educational community on how positive experiences uh, dictate brain health, academic performance, and social well being. We would like to thank Dr. Marlin for speaking with us today, and we look forward to her insights on trauma, the neurobiology of stress. And Dr. Marlin, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Osman, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you for coming today to hear more about our research and how this relates to race and trauma. The title of my talk today is Nature, Nurture, and the Science of Parenthood. And I'll start off with a quote, a quote from uh, the, the good book, the, the, the Bible. Um, the uh, train up, and by the, by the good book meaning, that's just the term that I, I chose to use just now, not that it's the only good book. The train up uh, a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. 
And this is a form of um, wisdom that is passed down through many cultures, how to uh, inform children, inform offspring, how to take care of themselves and other for the perpetuation of our species. And that's shown in an example here, where in some ways we do this as parents and as caregivers through uh, nature. Um, it is naturally uh, inherent and uh, for an offspring to know how to suckle um, when it's born. So here's a picture of my son. He, we're at the beach and he's, he's drinking from his bottle. This is not something I had to teach him how to do. He was innately born with this information that said, I can now acquire information if I move my mouth like this. This came uh, in the womb. But sometimes he's caught eating things like pennies or rocks. And so we have to teach him the best way to eat things that are healthy for him. And in this case, another way that parents or caregivers take care of their offspring is through nurture. So we see, usually hear nature versus nurture. And so here he's eating a cracker that I gave him, and this is something that's healthy for him to eat as opposed to um, something like a rock or penny. Uh, in the same way, humans inform their offspring, either through learning of nature and nurture, but when the environment is constantly changing, this may change the way parents can inform their offspring and teach them and raise them the way to grow up. And uh, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is work that is motivated by a hard time in, uh, in, in the world's history after World War II, and it's called the Dutch Hunger Winter. And so after the slide, I'm going to show you a few um, images that may be hard to see. But during the Dutch Hunger Winter, the Netherlands were cut off from food because they decided to protest the Nazi troops. And in protest of um, transporting Nazi troops, they were cut off from food. And that's shown here, um, where the population suffered from starvation. They were forced to eat things like tulip bulbs and even rocks and um, wood. And the, in, in, the environment was famished for this uh, nine, nine months after the, uh, the end of World War II. And what's intriguing about this unfortunate experience is that after this period of time, because the Netherlands took such clean note of who served in the military, the children and the grandchildren of those that suffered from the Dutch hunger winter started to express metabolic issues like hypertension, which is high blood pressure, diabetes, and even schizophrenia. And so the question that was posed after this short study was how does an experience of the environment inform the children and the grandchildren. Not in the same way I can teach my son what to eat and not to eat, but metabolically informing them that maybe they're going to be born in a land where there is no food and their body's preparing them for that. But when there is plenty, we suffer from diabetes and hypertension. And so this question is not one that, um, that uh, can be easily parsed out um, with these studies, especially because many of those who, um, who were survivors of Dutch hunger winter went on to uh, have birth, uh, give birth have now passed on. So there's labs, for example, Oliver Randall's lab at the University of Massachusetts, who replicated this study in uh, a part of the study in mice. And so what he did is he used mice and he put them on either a low protein or high fat diet. He then bred them. So the F0 is filial zero. These are the parents and filial one are the offspring. And when he bred them by just taking in vitro fertilization with the sperm and egg, he saw that the offspring had altered metabolic reproductive success and even behaviors. So starvation or high fat diet in the parents led to a change in the offspring of mice. And so this was the first step in us being able to iron out potentially what could have um, occurred during this stressful period of time. Um, another lab of uh, 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 Brian Diaz and Carrie Ressler at Harvard University also explored this question of how a stressor can inform the, um, the inheritance of an offspring. But they did this not with food starvation, but with a foot shock, so a stressor and an odor. And what they showed that there were changes in the brain and also in the behavior of the offspring after this foot shock. And uh, as I entered into my, my postdoctoral work, I found this such an intriguing question. How can a memory of a stressful event live on in the offspring? How is a parent potentially preparing its offspring and raising it up in the way it should go even when the parent is no longer present? And as exciting as this work is, unfortunately it received a lot of pushback. And that's shown here um, on, and pushback in general when it comes to transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So experts debunk study found that Holocaust trauma is inherited. Um, inherited memories too good to be true. 
or too much success for recent groundbreaking epigenetic experiments. And what we see as scientists is a lot of the time we receive pushback because it's not always easy to iron out the questionable aspects of a human experience. Are the offspring hearing these stories at the dinner table and saying that this is the stress that they're experiencing or is it happening epigenetically? That's because humans are complex and that's okay. But we're able, we're allowed, we're Al, um, we have the allowance to use other model organisms to really help iron out these questions so we can bring this information back to humans and really parse out what can be happening when it comes to epigenetic inheritance of stresses and trauma. And that's what we do here at the Marlin Lab at Columbia University. So I'm here with two of my students um, who uh, do some of the amazing work and are part of the lab. And what I'll show you here is a video expressing what we do um, in the lab. This is a video done by Science Friday that uh, focused on our lab. And so I'm showing you here, we have mice, we present them with an odor. In this case, the odor smells like almond and it makes the iron, ion, our almond neurons in the brain fire. What we do is we present that odor and we co-terminate that with the light foot shock. So when the animal smells that odor, it runs away. And that's shown here. On the top, we have an animal that was paired with almond. On the bottom, this animal got almond and it got a control smell uh, alcohol, but it didn't get the foot shock at the same time as it got the odor. And what you'll see is on the top animal, the chamber that has the almond smell, the animal has learned that it will not want to go in there. Even though there's no shock in this chamber, he remembers and she remembers that it predicts a shock, whereas on the bottom, it doesn't seem to mind. So we wanted to ask, how does remembering a stressor or a trauma change the brain? And specifically, does it change the sensory neurons, the first order neurons that smell these odors in the brain? And so here's a schematic um, drawn by my student, Yasmin. And uh, what we have here are cells that are in the mouse nose. And the beauty of studying the nose, we call it the main olfactory epithelium, uh, is that in here, each one of these cells expresses one type of receptor, it's like a lock and key, that allots for that odor to be, um, to be recognized in the brain. And this work um, was revolutionary to the field. My postdoctoral researcher, Richard Axel, along with his postdoc at the time, uh, Laura, um, Linda Buck, my apologies, um, won the Nobel Prize for this in 2004. And so after we're able to look at the main olfactory epithelium, what we do is we clear it using a system of chemicals and we're able to clear the whole tissue and look at the single cells. And I'm showing you that here where we have a main olfactory epithelium cleared, but the cells still maintain their structure. And we take them and put them into something called the light sheet microscope shown here. And we're able to look at these neurons the single neurons to see what possibly can be changing. And so I'm here explaining to my student the different changes in the neurons over this period of time to see how the stressor can affect the behavior and affect the brain morphology. And so here's an image of what we can get with the light sheet. Here's an image of the main olfactory epithelium um, and how they send their projections into the brain. Um, and so this is just showing that we can get these beautiful images and really look at what changes can happen in the brain. And here we're able to look at single neurons, and here's an example of a cleared brain, and count them and see, does the memory of a stressful experience, of a traumatic experience, live in the changing of the neurons and the number of the neurons in the nose? And so what we found was extremely exciting. I'm showing you, I'll only show you two pieces of data, but here we have animals that we call them home. They just hang out in the cage. They've never experienced any odor. And this is how many cells they have in their nose. So on average, 125. Uh, we have the unpaired, which you saw on the bottom. So these are the animals that had um, the smell of almond and they had a shock, but it didn't happen at the same time. So I never really learned that the odor predicts a shock. However, in the paired animals, the animals that experienced the traumatic event paired with the odor, we saw that the brain morphology changed. There was an increase in cell number to the cells that respond to that odor. So the brain has changed its morphology in response to the stressful event. Moreover, what we were able to replicate and show that it's extremely exciting is this. This bar is the F1. These animals are the offspring of those that were paired. They have never experienced the smell of almond. And yet, similar to what the parallels that we observed in the Dutch hunger winter, they are born expressing more cells without ever experiencing the odor. 
And so we were really intrigued as to how that memory can go on, go on in the news for the first part. And secondly, be passed on to the second generation. And so we're able to do that by labeling birthdays of cells. So I'm just showing you here these cells that are in red in the middle. These are cells that are three days old and we can, tra we can track them to see how long they last. And you can see them at 21 days, they migrate throughout the brain. And we use this to label cells that are born during and after the stressful experience. And what our lab does now is we are able to say, this is a cell that's red, which means it's born after the time of the stress. We're able to sort them out from cells that are not red, so they're not born after the time of the stress. And then we look at their data. We look at their RNA. And this is an aspect that will say, this identity of the cell, this experience of the cell is holding some value. And not only can we do this in the nose, we also can do this using sperm. So here's a, a video I was able to take of um, a mouse. This is a live mouse that I was able to extract sperm from with a syringe. So we can look at different time points and really look into the sperm and say, what are we doing? What's being sorted and what RNA we can, can we get out of that? What is the message that can be passed along to the second generation? All right. So I show you a picture here of um, these two lovely people and this baby. You can tell by all the uh, alcohol in the back, it's probably my first birthday because this is me and these are my parents. And I show you this picture because I'm showing you images of the nose and sperm and how they can change. But this is not just motivated by my love for biology. My parents, the people I'm showing you right here, were foster parents. And so I had the blessed opportunity to grow up around foster siblings. Um, and during the day we had fun and played around like regular kids. Um, but at night we, I heard their stories of why they wound up in foster care and how they wound up in my family home and why my parents were now their parents because their parents didn't have the capability or didn't have a possibility to take care of them the way that mine did. And this really motivates my work because although they weren't living with their parents, they still suffered from elements that their parents had suffered. And yet, we know that with good caregiving, some of these things can be mitigated. And so I really dedicate a lot of my work to them. And even though we're looking at single cells in the brain, I know that these single cells hold value when we're able to take it, figure out how biology works, and then bring that to people who are hurting. And here they are here during my, uh, my, my graduate career. And so um, one more motivation for my work, um, I have an email here that I'm highlighting to you and I just have uh, two uh, lines highlighted. One line says, uh, we I had considered not going to your talk as I was worried about a biological child bias and my husband and I are in the process of adopting. Um, there are emails like this that really also continue to motivate the work that we do because what we're showing here is not just that it's only nature and it's only nurture, but it's nature and nurture and they can both work to hurt but also to help and prepare. And so with that, I'll end with a quote. We are wired to care about the needs of others. I think it's in our DNA. And that's coming from Kahindi Wiley, whose uh, art I used in this on the presentation today. And with that, I'd like to thank the Marlin Lab, the people, amazing people who do the work um, here at Columbia. We opened up our doors the January of this year. And I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and desire to learn more about racism and transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of trauma. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlin. That was honestly very fascinating. I have a million questions, but um, we'll hold them for you uh, to the end. But just briefly, do you know if these changes have been seen in brain regions related to fear responses like the amygdala? Are there... that, is, that is our next step in the lab. So we're in the process of looking both in parent and offspring to see if the child, offspring are a little bit just more nervous when they smell this odor, um, or they're suffering from anything that we could parallel to anxiety. Or... Are we just preparing the offspring to say, okay, if you smell this odor in the future, you now can learn more quickly or learn to avoid it more quickly? Perfect, thank you. Yeah, and we'll delve into a bit more questions um, towards the end. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so now we will move on to our second speaker um, who will give us um, a more clinical perspective on inherited trauma. Um, it's, more, it's my pleasure to present to you Dr. Danielle spearman uh, Kamblad, who is a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Connecticut and Virginia. Uh, she's a media contributor to popular press, consultant to organizations and churches, and a speaker. Dr. Kamblad received her Bachelor's of Art degree in psychology from the University of Connecticut and graduated um, as an honor scholar. 
She earned her doctorate in clinical psychology as a diversity fellow at the University of Hartford's Graduate Institute of Professional Psychology and subsequently completed her internship and postdoctoral training at the Village for Families and Children, Hartford, Connecticut. Dr. Danielle has almost 20 years of experience in the mental health field. She is a founder of the clinical director um, of Family Focused Counseling Services, which provides mental health services to children, adolescents, and adults with a wide range of psychological disorders. She is also a psychologist with the Behavioral Wellness Clinic and is passionate about dismantling racial disparities in mental health. She, uh, she practices from a culturally informed and racial trauma lens by understanding the impact of social injustices um, or social justice issues on Black, Indigenous and people of colour. She has um, specialised expertise in racial trauma, cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, parental mood and anxiety disorders and infant and children and adolescent mental health. With that being said, we are extremely pleased to have Dr. Danielle here to discuss with us intergenerational racial stress and trauma. Dr. Kamlad, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Osma, for that very warm welcome. I'm very honored to be here with all of you today. So first I wanna talk about common racial traumas, which include police harassment, search and assault, workplace discrimination, community violence, murder of loved ones, incarceration, distressing medical and or childbirth experiences, experiencing or witnessing torture, ethnic cleansing and persecution, destruction of cultural practices, living in a war zone, immigration dif difficulties and deportation. We have a plethora of research demonstrating mental health outcomes due to racism. Adverse outcomes include PTSD, stress, anxiety, depression, substance use, alcohol abuse, binge eating, severe psychological distress, psychosis, disability, suicide, and OCD. This is a model adapted from Dr. Monica Williams and colleagues, which explains how the cumulative effects of racism can lead to PTSD. According to this model, predispositions of vulnerability, such as epigenetic risk factors from historical or cultural trauma or racial oppression set up a stress base, which is exacerbated by cumulative experiences of overt and covert racism. If individuals are the targets of racially traumatic events, they will experience emotions associated with this event, such as shock, fear, or anger. If these experiences are invalidated, then these individuals may develop symptoms of PTSD, such as intrusive thoughts, avoidance, hypervigilance, and negative changes in mood and cognitions. Also due to institutional racism and barriers to treatment, professional help may not be accessible, which maintains or worsens PTSD symptoms. This could take the form of discomfort um, when addressing issues of race, leaving racial PTSD and trauma untreated. Um, you know, when healthcare professionals just don't feel comfortable with talking about race. Our world is experiencing a double pandemic with COVID-19 and racial trauma. Race-based stress is an additional layer to the chaos that we're dealing with right now. So it's important to keep in mind how trauma is transmitted generationally. People of color are born into this world inheriting racial trauma by direct experience, which is further aggravated by the traumatic experiences of their parents and grandparents. Think about a wound as an analogy that wants to heal, but re-injury is inevitable. This is what intergenerational transmission of trauma feels like. The key difference between PTSD and racial trauma that I like for people to keep in mind is that most people are able to heal when the trauma goes away with PTSD as we know it. However, with racial trauma, it's continuous because racism is everywhere. The challenge to heal intergenerationally is just greater. The pandemic has brought racial trauma to the forefront as victims must face the unthinkable double dilemma of navigating the safety of their health and race. Now I wanna explain what the transmission of trauma looks like clinically. So my first case example is a 30 year old indigenous woman with a history of trauma as a child. She experiences racial trauma at the workplace when a supervisor tells her to make a rain dance for them. 
and another coworker makes jokes against indigenous people. When she speaks out against the behavior, her experience is dismissed as a misperception. Prior to this experience, she was a high achiever, successful in her career. She could effortlessly give public presentations and was a confident problem solver. Her symptoms included hypervigilance, GI symptoms. She felt like nauseous all the time, diarrhea, tearfulness, brain fog, psychomotor retardation, lack of energy, pain atta panic attacks, excuse me, exaggerated sorrow response and suicidal ideation. She was unable to work and describe herself as a completely different person who struggled with self-care. She could no longer give public presentations that had difficulty with concentration and decision-making. She begins to have nightmares about childhood trauma. And so in her family, she really described how trauma and abuse was normalized as she would hear statements from her parents, such as, if you didn't go through that, you wouldn't be so good in school, or we all experienced that, and so you should expect it too. Another case example is a 20 year old African-American man. He experiences racial trauma at a college campus when targeted and racially profiled by campus police. His symptoms included flashbacks, hypervigilance, avoidance, an exaggerated startle response, heightened reactivity, persistent negative beliefs and anxiety. He begins to avoid all campuses, feels more on guard and irritable when a police officer is nearby. He feels that no one can be trusted and the world is against us. So in terms of how the intergenerational transmission of trauma looked within his family, he recalls the traumatic stories that his parents experienced with systemic racism and his grandparents during the civil rights movement. He expects that racial discrimination is inevitable because of the recurrent situations in his family and other families of color. He carries the burden of their pain while navigating microaggressions on a job and a school. This can lead to a heightened hypervigilance. We also have to consider what minoritized groups have learned from history. The infamous Tuskegee experiment is another example of intergenerational racial trauma. And that was a 40 year experiment with 600 black men in Alabama with syphilis. Officials refused to tell patients their diagnosis and refused to treat them for the disease. Many of these men died and their wives or children contracted syphilis. Research has long suggested that the ill effects of the Tuskegee study extend beyond those men and their families to the greater whole of Black culture. Black patients consistently express less trust in their physicians and the medical system than white patients. They're more likely to believe medical conspiracies and are much less likely to have common positive experiences in healthcare settings. These have all been connected to misgivings among Black patients about Tuskegee and America's long history of real medical exploitation of Black people. A similar medical issue that also relates to trauma generationally is the Black maternal mortality rate in this country. The U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world and the only rate that is rising the maternal mortality rate is significantly higher among black women who are three to four times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy related complications. Other birthing people of color, including Hispanic, Native American, Asian American and Pacific Islander women also suffer from disproportionately high rates of adverse maternal health outcomes. The Black Maternal Mo uh, Health Momnibus Act includes a series of 12 bills to save mom's lives and end racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health outcomes. That was actually released earlier this year from Congress. Women of color are traumatized by their hospital experiences and avoid treatment. We do have validated scales that can be used to assess for racial trauma. And for the sake of time, I won't go through all of these, but many of these can be found in, in public domain on my colleague, Dr. Monica Williams' website, which is mentalhealthdisparities.org. The Yukon Unrest is a clinical interview and checklist to determine if racial trauma meets DSM-5 criteria for PTSD. It's available in English, Spanish, and French and was developed um, by Dr. Monica Williams. It's important to help clients process their experiences of racism. You wanna help them to talk through their experiences. 
you want to respect client boundaries. Clients will have different levels of readiness for confronting racism. You want to go at your client's own pace. You also want to provide gentle encouragement as needed. And you want to praise clients for taking the difficult task of retelling their story. You also want to encourage the use of micro inter interventions. For example, every time I see you, you say things like that and it's hurtful. That's why I don't come by as often. We wanna promote growth in meaning making, like searching for meaning after experiencing racial trauma. And we wanna reframe, we wanna help clients to recognize that whenever they experience any form of racial discrimination, that is not their fault. And we wanna help them to prevent internalized racism. We also want to help them honor their story. And storytelling is a style of relating that is culturally congruent with many people of color. It's a very effective tool for remembering and retelling their story. So how do we help people of color to cope? We do that by encouraging them to place the blame where it belongs, on the perpetrator and on cultural dysfunction. You also wanna help them seek social support within their community, like close friends, family, people who get it. Also encouraged to limit exposure to cues of racism as, as needed while recovering. It's really critical um, when a person is still recovering from racial trauma to, to ask them to limit social media because there's just so many triggers on the internet. Also utilizing religious or spiritual practices for comfort such as prayer or meditation. Assess for safety and create an escape plan if needed for some of your clients. Also help facilitate empowerment, encourage a self-care plan, encourage them to engage in peaceful activism that helps them to make meaning from their pain. There's, there's purpose in their pain is what a lot of people um, who have certain spiritual beliefs, I, I've heard them say there's purpose in my pain. So you want to really draw from that. Also educate others and be patient, facilitate mutual understanding. Here is some recommended reading to dive more into this topic. You could download many of these at the website listed below. That's um, www.monicawilliams.com. Here's also some of my media interviews and the popular press about racial trauma that you can find on my website, which is drdaniellespearman.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen and join me today. And here's my contact info or where you can find me on social media. Joe? Um, am I on? Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you, doc, Dr. Uh, Kambar and Dr. Marlin uh, for your presentations. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Joe Simon. I'll be the moderator for the Q&A session. Um, we have a lot of questions come in. We have uh, time to go through them. So uh, let's get started. Um, we're gonna start with this first question, kind of like combining some things together. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, kind of exposed some many uh, in, in, inequalities in our healthcare. Um, and that's, and uh, what is the, what has been the contribution um, of these inequalities to uh, um, generational trauma? What's the potential contribution of these, uh, these health inequalities to, uh, yeah, to general, um, sorry, generational tra uh, trauma? Sorry about that. And uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Kambar, you can, uh, I guess, start that one off, sorry. Okay, sure, no problem. So, you know, the black maternal mortality rate, as I was describing earlier, is a crisis in our country. And, you know, just the thought of seeing our, our moms and our aunties die in the hospital, that becomes a secondary or what we call a vicarious trauma to other family members who may adopt similar and valid concerns to avoid hospitals due to health disparities. And um, from a lot of the moms I've spoken to, a lot of Black mothers don't feel heard. Also, um, mothers of other ethnic backgrounds uh, from other minoritized groups, they don't feel heard and supported by medical professionals and, and those valid concerns become a learned cultural experience. So that's how all of that contributes to a intergenerational um, transmission of trauma. And I'll uh, follow up by saying a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, 
the diseases that will allot you to more likely um, suffer horribly from COVID or put you, become hospitalized are some of these diseases that we are, that I discussed earlier, the diabetes, the hypertension. And if there's a correlation with these and uh, intergenerational and transgenerational traumas and stresses, then it just, it's a, it's a twofold a double hit. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So moving on from that question, I have another one that a few people asked, and that is, um, it's kind of a nature versus nurture type of question. Um, they, they basically ask uh, um, if the F1 never experiences, you know, for example, with the almonds, if the F1 never experiences what happened uh, from with their parents, they ever, sm they ever smell almond, um, would they still uh, like hold on to this type of, uh, tr uh, I guess, like uh, phenotype or this type of trauma? So I want to make sure that that part is very clear because the amazing aspect of what we observed is that these animals, the F1, have never smelled almond. I'm not even presenting almond to them in the data I showed you. They are born with a change morphology, a change in their brain structure without ever experiencing the almond. It's as if the only experience of almond is through the memory of their parents' stress. Okay. Just a follow-up to that. Um, somebody had asked if if you know the F1 generation never smells the almond, does do the changes ever reverse? Is there a time uh, period, you know, before these changes are reversed? Well, that's good. that's also a very intriguing question. We're looking at these animals and we're looking at the brains of these animals when they're adult. So at least into adulthood, these these changes still stand. And we're also um, stressing their parents when they were adult. So one of our big exciting questions is. What if we're actually stressing them during this more mobile, this more facile um, phase of childhood and also looking at childhood, you know, that childhood traumas and, uh, and adult traumas, are, they do um, render differently when it comes to behavior. So we're looking at them into adulthood and these changes do last into adulthood. I'm sorry, Joe, and then I'll hand over back to you. But do, do you ever see them go on to like F2 generation, f even if they don't ever get exposed to the, the trigger. And so we're doing that twofold. And I think this, this question really relates to this, this conversation we're having right now with racism and trauma. As um, Dr. Shambard uh, said earlier, it's not that you can have an experience and then you can escape what is racism. Racism is ingrained, at least in the United States, so heavily ingrained in our society. And so in order to take that mentality and approach it in our science, what we're doing is we have an experience, experiment where we have the F1 stress traumatized, the F2 stress traumatized, even though their parents were um, also traumatized, and that continues on. And similarly, we have another route that it's only one trauma, and we see how long that those changes last. And so the first one I described, I think, is what we can map on to what's happening here in the U.S. now, where trauma for racism has been happening for generations. And so if you're being born and you are Black, Indigenous, or a person of color in the United States, it's not just you're experiencing it one day on the street. This is an establishment of your life. And what does that look like over time for generations? And is this adaptive or maladaptive? And when does it change? That relates to one of the questions asked uh, by the audience from Pooja Viswanathan. Uh, thank you, doctors Marlon and Kim Blardy. Does your research point to how many generations racial stress and uh, trauma can remain? And are there biological interventions that have shown promise in alleviating intergenerational trauma in particular? So I wonder from the mouse data, Bianca, or the human data, Danielle, do you have any sense of how many generations it lasts? And then your point, Bianca, that the dose of the trauma, I mean, 400 years of racial trauma would be expected to produce a most stronger and longer lasting effect. Anyway, I'll ask both of you if you could comment on that. Well, from the data I've, I've read, it, it could be an exponential number. I mean, it slavery, when we look back at slavery centuries before, and we are still suffering. Um, so I haven't read of a limit as to how far this can go. Um, you know, the, what's, what's gonna be important is for us to mitigate the effects of the racial trauma as it's passed down, you know, biologic, I'm sure Dr. Marlin can speak more to, to that aspect than I can. Um, but from a clinical perspective, we really need to start mitigating the, the impact because it's, 
there is no like start point, end point, and, and then that's at the end. It's this is a recurrent thing that's passed down culturally um, from generation to generation, and, and we need to mitigate the impact of it by stopping at a systemic level and also treating at an individual and family level as well. But Dr. Marlon, I'm sure you have more to speak on the uh, epigenetic factors. Yeah. So when it comes to the research showing, oh, thank you very much for that, Pascal, for the research showing for the epigenetic markers, what we have to remember is that biology is not set up to destroy us. Biology wants us to survive. It wants us to thrive. We need to, we need our, we need to propagate for our, our race being the human race. And so when we see these changes, it's not necessarily that they are maladaptive. Um, I, I'm going to go back to the person's name who's quote this. I hate to misquote, um, but uh, there is a famous scientist, uh, Dr. Danielle, you'll know, who, um, is, uh, who does the ACE studies. Oh. Black woman who does the ACE yes. studies. Uh, her name is brain, brain fog. Right? Okay. Who does give talk? I apologize. <laughs> Nonetheless, what she, uh, one of her quotes is this. Um, mm-hmm. When you're running through the forest and you mm-hmm. see a bear and you have that adrenaline rush, rush to fight or flight, that makes sense. That's biology mm-hmm. saving you. So you're going to run or you're going to fight. Mm-hmm. The problem is when the bear lives in your living room. That constant trauma, that constant stress is not biologically sound. Mm-hmm. And this is where these maladaptations take place. So I would never want like our research to directly reflect that you have a stressful or traumatic experience and you're in for the rest of your life, you are no longer capable of being a full human. No, biology adapts. It's when society doesn't adapt to what biology says, which is making sure our race as a human race survives. When those two are in are fighting, that's when we have these problems. Okay. You know, Bianca, one thing I'd add from a research perspective is that when you and I, for example, design experiments in our labs looking at how trauma in one generation can be passed on to another generation in a mouse, yes. we typically just apply the trauma once. In your case, you apply the food, uh, you know, the odor learning to one generation. What if you applied it to 10, 20, 100 successive generations? what would that effect be? Would it accumulate? Would it last longer? It would be interesting to do those kinds of studies. That's exactly where we're going. Does it become innate? Is it something that was learned in one generation? Are we now inheriting an innate memory? Yeah. All right. Um, That was a great discussion. Uh, We have in the chat, uh, they're saying it was uh, Nadine Burke Harris. Yes, thank you, Nadine Burke Harris. All right. They, Thank they, you to whoever saved us from that. Yeah, when, uh, know what's going on. Um, so uh, kind of like uh, going on along those lines, um, this question is com- kind of coming up in, in a sense of resilience. Um, you have, uh, you, you can have, you know, people going through this trauma. But let's say you have a, a, a parent who goes through trauma, but they find a way to, you know, uh, make it in this, in, in this, in this society. Um, is that, resilience could that resilience be passed on to their children i know we're talking in mouse or in um in clinical situations but like can is that passed on how 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 is that uh changing the the trajectory if you will neither by anybody can not answer that question i can speak from the clinical end not necessarily the the biological end i'll let dr marlin take that piece um from a clinical end yes it can make a significant difference because we are social beings. Um, You know, I think of social learning theory and we learn from our parents, our parents are models to us. So if our parents show how they can be resilient to how they can adapt, then the children, the offspring can also adapt. Um, So I, you know, I definitely agree with what Dr. Marlin shared earlier that we're not stuck. Um, It's just a matter of treating things, like I said, at a systemic level and then those who, who have healed, they can model what healing looks like to help the next generation. I think that's beautifully said. And, and I think the beauty of that question is that this is not something that is like just the bedside or just the, we say the lab bench, bench bedside. Um, like Dr. Rest, Dr. Ressler, myself, and also Dr. Osmond, who are working with mice, um, much research surrounding social behavior has shown is if you stress a mouse mm-hmm. and then you put him back in a cage by itself, that mouse is going to show stress, signs of stress. If you stress a mouse, but have a conspecific, a, a buddy in the cage with them, it mitigates the expression of stress and even mitigates the stress hormones. There's a biological change when you have partnership. 
And when Dr. Shamblar was going through um, the list of ways to adapt and having people surround you or be, uh, be part of like, um, I, I know I'm, I'm, my husband is a psychiatrist and he commonly says like, he recommends sending people to church or some type of group in which there's community and that actively mitigates these stressful experiences. And so to the extent that we can adapt and be resilient as a community and as people who care for one another and humans, I think that transcends um, biology and bench the bedside. I think, Bianca, you know, that's an important point to bring up when we're talking about people in the workplace. And, you know, often you find yourself isolated or one of, you know, very few people of color. But as soon as you have a community of similar people, then, yeah, you'll, you'll feel a lot better. You'll know how to address these um, issues a lot better. Joe, I'm going to let you ask the question that Joe brought up a really excellent point a few days ago and both Bianca and Dr. Danielle had really great answers um, for it. So Joe, I'm going to let you ask the question about uh, the monolith aspect. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, there are many black people around the world, you know, people of color, not just in America. Um, and so, but that the point is we're not a monolith. We're not one people um, in, 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 in that sense. There are many different uh, cultures, many different uh, ways of viewing things. And the, the question basically is, um, you know, is, is there any, uh, can inherited trauma uh, be different for a, a Black American versus a Black uh, person from a, uh, what we say, the UK, for example, or from somewhere else in the world? And I like Dr. to answer Martin, that. Okay. Um, yeah. That's okay. I like okay. to answer that. So yes, there can be differences, but I also want to highlight there's commonalities in the, in the experience of racial trauma. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. Recently, we heard about the thousands of Haitians that were deported from Texas. And the children, I think about them because I have four children myself and I can't even imagine, but children are victims vicariously through their parents. If they've ever seen their parents tortured, if they've been separated from um, their loved ones, all of that gets passed down. Um, and then when I think about here in, in the U.S., um, a lot of times we experience racial trauma in the workplace. Um, we'll experience racial trauma on a, on a college campus. Um, there's a racial microaggressions of the angry Black woman every time that a Black woman wants to speak out against racial injustice. So there, those are also forms of racial trauma that is learned within the culture and is passed down. Um, you know, we as parents, when we prepare our kids, we talk to them about racism and it's pretty much expected because it's everywhere. And so those are the differences in terms of concrete examples of what it can look like, but the commonalities are still the same is that it's passed down vicariously from generation to generation. Uh, Bianca, I remember you had a really good answer on a biological level. Um, I, what, I, what, what I'm thinking now is I wonder if this aligns with what we had discussed prior is um, in psychology, which is also um, a, an arm of my work, we describe the two-hit hypothesis. This is what I, maybe what I discussed before. This is what comes to mind right now. And with the two-hit hypothesis, what um, we describe as psychologists is that uh, an individual can have a traumatic experience during childhood, a very um, important time for development. And when they have a traumatic experience during childhood, and then another one as an adult, their behavioral response is different from those who had a pretty safe childhood and then had a traumatic experience as an adult. This is when we see a lot of these neuro, neurobiological and neuropathologies. Um, but when we're looking at the differences in the of, of us not being a monolith of, of Black people in the world, um, I believe that we're looking at two facets of this hypothesis. Um, one can be coming from a country where you are the majority. Um, I, I'm of lineage of both. My mother's from South America where, where she's the majority people. And one where you're minoritized people like my father's from the United States. And so having that cultural influence of being a majority of seeing teachers like you and doctors like you help to mitigate this response. Whereas the two hit hypothesis for many black Americans in the United States who were born here is the first hit is the ancestral hit. It is the slave hit that is still very much recent. Um, and so having being able to parse that out becomes hard because when it comes to racism, we're not talking about an actual genetic trait. We're look, talking about what people look like and are perceived as. People coming in from this country have that different second hit as opposed to those who were born in this country. And I think all of this really just 
it's entangling something that doesn't need to be disentangled because it shouldn't be the case. And unfortunately, we're spending so much energy trying to iron something out when we really should be ironing out from the other end, which is how do we gain respect as a Black people group all over the world? All right. um, I have a very interesting question here, and I'm going to kind of like rephrase it. Um, so when when we think about, you know, the inheritance of uh, trauma and whatnot, that's uh, or, or the, we think about the, the, the victim in this in this case. But I'm also wondering if like you have like aggressors like it can is that is that also passed down as like as a person becomes more aggressive or a mouse in this case becomes more aggressive? Would you think that their uh, their aggression towards another person um, would also be can be passed on to the uh, to the generations? So work, work that I can speak uh, very highly on when it comes to uh, behaviors that are passed down is this. I think this is very important, especially with the um, with that story that's very commonly associated with with racism, where like these people are quote unquote dangerous versus not. So I'll bring it back to mouse and rat studies. Um, a scientist here at, at uh, Columbia University, Francis Champagne, did these experiments in which she showed that you have a mother rat. Uh, you stress this mother rat out. So this mother rat has low bedding. Um, that's how we stress these uh, mothers out. And they're less likely to take good care of their children. This stress, unfortunately, changes the way they care for their child. They're less likely to lick their child and groom their child, mouse hugging or rat hugging their child. Um, parents who have bedding and they're fine, they're the wealthy parents, the other ones, they take um, fine care of their child. They're not stressed. If you then take those offspring and let them have kids, the kids who were, whose parents were stressed will also not hug their children, do the mouse hug and lick and groom. The parents, the kids who um, had parents who took care of them, they would take care of their offspring. Now you take these two and you switch them. So you do a foster care experiment and the way the parent treats you is what emerges and continues on. Even if there are biological traits that say I slightly am more on the edge, I have more cortisol, things related to stress. The way the parents treat you is what's passed on. And so I just, I, I'm hesitant to say like some aspect of aggression is passed on as opposed to what your life experience is and the way you are treated in that life experience is what you pass on. That's really what's, what was being um, observed and passed on in, in those studies. So, so mm -hmm. I guess like, kind of like uh, to Alan's like, would you say that the, um, the, uh, I guess we use the word like, like the cultural experience or the experience you get from the, uh, the environment um, would have an effect on the, sorry, the cultural inheritance, which you gain, which you gain from your parents or whatnot, would that have, that has an effect on the genetic? Um... Hands down, hands down, but it can be mitigated. If you have like, my parent didn't hug me enough, the mouse hugs enough. You take that animal, you put it into a, a big hugging mouse mom. Although there are different genetic elements that may still maintain, the behavior changes and the offspring are now going to be able to take care of their kids. Okay. Sorry, I think you had some something there. I can go on forever about that. I just think it's really, really exciting. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, that's why it's really important in, in our experiments to control for maternal influences. I know during my PhD, we cross fostered almost every cohort just to, to control for that factor. So it's just interesting to hear you say that it really does influence the, the child's behavior based on how their the, the mother had behaved. Um, we have, we're coming to, you know, close to the end. And I really wanted to uh, wrap up by having like take home messages from each of our speakers. Joe, I'll let you. Um... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's think here. Um, you know, we do want a take home message. We don't want to be all doom and gloom. Like, you know, you have something yeah. that's it. You know, you're, you're man, that's it for you. Um, so, you know, to, bo to both our speakers, what would, would you think the take home message be? One from a, uh, a, a um, macroscopic level, basically like as uh, institutions in terms of doing research and as, you know, uh, societies and governments, what are the ways we can, um, I guess, mitigate, you know, these, these types of traumas? And also from the, like the microscopic level, the individual who's watching this right now and saying like, I'm not a researcher, I can't do these things. Like, but what can they do in their, like, you know, hugging their kids maybe. Like, what can they do in their everyday life to, you know, uh, mitigate the, the transfer of these um, factors? On a systemic level, and I want to start there because I think it's not fair for 
any minoritized group to carry the burden of fixing, of fixing society when we weren't the ones that initiated it. So I wanna start on a systemic level. And I think that it's important to keep in mind um, that you know, racial trauma is real. We have so much research out there. Um, you know, we, we have the epigenetic factors that Dr. Marlin talked about and all of that biological research. So there's, there's a plethora of data that has really confirmed that all of this is a reality. And so I think it's important to make policies that really hold perpetrators accountable to all of the disparities that we see in health. We see disparities even in, in finances, you know, who's going to get accepted for, you know, approved for a mortgage and who doesn't, you know, the racism is on so many different levels. And so I think it's important to start there um, to have more allyship, you know, so if people see um, a non-minoritized person targeting uh, through microaggressions, a minoritized person that that needs to be called out privately one-on-one -on -one with that person and just really start to hold each other more accountable. So that's on a systemic level. Um, you know, on, on an individual level, I'm a psychologist. I do a lot of therapy and, and treat racial trauma. It, it really is important for people to, to go to therapy to start to heal. Um, you know, but again, we have to be careful with, with the wording and the language of this because I don't believe in pathologizing justifiable anger. Mm -hmm. And so when people experience an injustice, the, the natural adaptive response is to call it out and to be upset. And there, should, there shouldn't be any negative connotation around that. Um, and also on a familial level, for parents to be able to model to their kids how they, how they cope, how they get through it, how, how they've overcome. And so on, a, on an individual level, we can work on ourselves, uh, but even more importantly, on a, on a systemic level, to, just to really put the blame where the blame is due, because in psychology, we have a theory called fundamental attribution bias. And it's just another way of saying blaming the victim. And with all of the police brutality and just all of the news events, what we see with all different types of minoritized groups, when we speak out, we get penalized or there, there's a punitive approach and those punitive approaches need, need to be changed. So rather than society blaming the victim, we need to start holding the perpetrators more accountable. Let, let's focus more of our, of our energy on changing policy and really balancing out the wealth that, that we have in society. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's a million dollar ticket right there. So <laughs> thank you for, for priming with that. Um, I'd like to say that as, as, a, as a biologist, first and foremost, that nature has a setup for survival. So we have to remember what our end goal is. And if our end goal is for survival of our species, of the race and of the human race, then you take a look at the data I showed you today, where a foot shock can change the morphology of the brain and then take a step back and think about what we're doing to our society. If a pain on a foot can change the brain, what are we doing to people at the border? What are we doing to people who we continually separate from money, from education, from health? It's more than just the foot shock. And these are the big changes that we're seeing in our studies. And so if our end goal is to support our community and support our world as a whole, I would also just re really want our audience members to remember, because the audience member, you guys are the ones that are here. You guys are the ones that do care and are intrigued and are, want to make a change here. That a little foot shock can make a change, but in the same way, stuff I didn't show you, a little caring can as well. So being that person to show, for, for lack of a scientific word, show that love and show that caring for our conspecifics, our brothers and sisters here on this earth, makes more of a change. And that's really why I want our, our, our research, our data, but also our conversation to, um, to end up on. So thank you. Thank you both for that. And Joe, before you wrap up, I just wanted to say, you know, if there's one thing this pandemic has taught us is how interconnected we are. So if one thing is happening at one side of the world, it trickles down and it affects us. And we should think the same about, uh, you know, race and people of different cultures and different communities. What's happening to them negatively or positively will also affect us. And so... I hope we can be more selfless, uh, selfish and more selfless and think about each other and how to improve each other's lives. And I also want to say, too, is that if people are reflective, you know, going back to, to love, if people are reflective and they, and they think about, OK, how will my actions impact other people? It's, it's the little things 
in life that can make a huge difference. Little things, be, be reflective, think about, will, will this be offensive? And, and don't be afraid to receive constructive feedback from others. Um, you know, if, if we make a mistake, and we've all done them, we've all committed microaggressions somewhere in our past with something or, you know, with someone. Um, be, be, be reflective and be willing to treat other people the way we really want to be treated. L loving your neighbor as yourself. This is the golden rule that we're all taught at some point. Agreed. All right. Uh, those were all lovely um, take-home messages. I'm almost, oof, got to <laughs> come back down here. All right. And, you know, in with that, uh, we would like to wrap up today's session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danielle spearman uh, Kamblar and Dr. Uh, Bianca Marlin uh, for your time and everyone for participating today. Um, we'd also like to thank Drs. Eric Nessler, Gary Buss, and Angel Palermo uh, for the funding and space to have discussions, very important um, discussions like this one today. And we also like to thank the Digital Media Center of uh, Veronica and everybody working there um, for the uh, admin and technical support, putting this all together. We couldn't have done it without you guys. And um, again, you know, we uh, hope this information was informative. And we will actually be uh, having another session uh, shortly, and we'll be uh, giving you information about that. Until then, take care and be safe. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank evening. You. Bye.